Thank you all so much for letting me be here today. I'm very honored to be here. I want to say a very special thank you to my parents for preparing me and raising me in faith to be here today. So let me begin with story. Laura and I, we did premarital classes with a church when we lived in Northern Virginia. The teacher talked to us about a ruler. He said, engaged couples can get really worked up about the engagement, especially the week of the wedding itself. But if the length of your marriage is like a ruler, the engagement and the wedding, well, that's only the first millimeter. It's the rest of the ruler, the marriage, that really matters. Well, I can tell you when we got married, we did get pretty worked up. We were married on September 15th, 2001, four days after 9-11. With the minister's guidance that week, we did decide to move forward with the wedding, though even more crazy stuff happened. We had one groomsman who practically broke his leg the day before the wedding, and while we were giving our vows, another groomsman passed out, locked his legs. So... It was quite memorable, to say the least. But despite being such a memorable time, in the end, it's nothing compared to the 22 years that Laura and I have been married, and hopefully many years to come. Years later, I've thought about that ruler analogy, and I've realized that for all of us, our time on earth is equivalent to that first inch, and it's the rest of the ruler. That's our time in eternity except our time in heaven can be more like a yardstick. It just keeps going and going and extends out into the street. You know, eternity, though, it's kind of a hard concept to put your mind around. So think about it this way. Abraham today would be like a little over 4,000 years old. And when we sing Amazing Grace, we talk about 10,000 years old. So Abraham's just getting started in heaven. God gives us a more wonderful eternity than we can possibly imagine. And it's with those who love him through the grace of his son, Jesus Christ. God's a giver. So I believe when we become driven by that eternity, by Jesus, our perspective evolves. Love, forgiveness, and generosity, they become bigger priorities in our lives. So today, I'm going to focus on the generosity priority, and I have three main points. Number one, generosity aligns your heart with God. Number two, generosity builds faith. And number three, gratitude feeds generosity. Number one, generosity aligns your heart with God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. What is treasure? What are our hearts focused on? I can tell you, as a financial planner, treasure is money or investments, assets for lots of people. Believe me, when you put enough money in a certain stock or investment, you tend to pay attention to it. If you own enough Marriott stock, you're not staying in a Hilton. So, other things can be treasure for people too. Their house, their car, their boat, their smartphone. But for a lot of people, their heart is with the people they love, and that is their real treasure. They say, if you want to know where somebody's heart really is, take a look at their calendar, see where they spend their time. Take a look at their bank statement, see where they spend their money. So my question today, is God first in our hearts? Because we are first in God's heart. We are God's treasure. God wants us to be generous and to have a heart for giving. Jesus said, don't store, up don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. God wants our treasure to be in him and in love for other people. Not in our stuff or just our money here on earth, which we can't take with us anyway. Has anyone ever seen a U-Haul being dragged by in a hearse? Doesn't happen. We can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. Send on ahead the types of treasure that heaven puts value on. Things like generosity and love, service to others. 
A truly blessed life is a life where you are a blessing to others. People ask me a lot, what's the greatest investment you can make? Well, I think there's two. I think the greatest investment you can make first is believing in and loving Jesus, giving your life to Jesus so that you can live in eternity with him. And second, it's to have the eternal perspective that God wants us to learn to love others and learn to be generous while we're here on earth because loving and serving others is part of what we're going to be doing in heaven. Talk about compound interest. Warren Buffett's got nothing on Jesus. You want to be better at focusing on treasures in heaven? Remember what believers already understand. God owns everything already. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God is the creator, provider, and owner of all that we have. God gave us talent, gave us determination. We go out then and earn whatever assets we own. But we're simply stewards for a time of what God gives us on earth. Step back and think about it. Isn't it a wonderful mindset to realize that God gives us some awesome gifts to steward over for hopefully 80 to 100 years to use to help others while we're here on earth? And then we get to go be with him in paradise. Here's an example for you to ponder on. So imagine this. Imagine I'm with my daughters, Reagan and McKenna. It's a Saturday afternoon. Reagan's already eaten lunch, and or McKenna's already eaten lunch. Reagan hadn't, and Reagan loves Chick-fil-A. So she's like, Dad, can we get some Chick-fil-A? So we pull into the Chick-fil-A drive through and we get some nuggets. The nuggets are handed over. They smell really good. And I ask Reagan, can I have a nugget and give one to your sister as well? Well, imagine if Reagan were to just say this, Dad, those are my nuggets. Why do I have to share? Here's what goes through my mind if I heard her say that. Reagan, I drove you here and I bought those nuggets. I can take away those nuggets if I want to. And I don't really need her nuggets. I can buy another tray for myself and a tray for her sister if I wanted to. Now imagine this. Imagine if Reagan said, Dad, those nuggets smell great. Thank you so much for getting them. Would you like one? I bet you want one too, McKenna. Here you go. Now, in that example, I'm seeing that I can trust her to be grateful and to be generous. And that's what I'm trying to teach her for later when she's all grown up and she has her own family. But God's like that. God is our provider. God gives us our nuggets. God wants us to be grateful for what we have and to lovingly give back and to share with others. And in, do, in doing so, have faith that God will continue providing for us. And that takes me to my second point. Generosity builds faith. Giving, it requires faith that you'll still have enough to provide for your needs. Jesus said, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God wants you to have faith that you can be generous and still have all you need. In today's Old Testament scripture reading from Malachi 3, God says through Malachi, For I, the Lord, do not change. So that implies he was the same God before, as he is today, as he will be in the future. God also says in the scripture, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Those are powerful words, robbing God in our tithes and offerings. I thought about it, and I actually think robbing God could mean because God loves us so very much, we are robbing God of the opportunity to bless us. First, let's look at what a tithe is. A tithe in Hebrew means a tenth. Tithing is when the first 10% goes to God. In Deuteronomy 14.22, Set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God. 
And importantly, it's the first 10%, not anything other than the first, because God is always first. The principle of tithing first fruits, it's illustrated in lots of parts of the Bible. One example is the story of Cain and Abel, when Abel gave the firstborn of his block, and Cain brought the less favorable fruit of the fruit of the ground in the course of time. The principle of tithing this first fruits, it's also illustrated in the book of Joshua, when God had the Israelites put the spoils from Jericho, their first victory in the promised land, back into the treasury of the Lord. Someone took from that treasury, and not until that money came back into the treasury did they have future victories. Then the Israelites got to keep and enjoy the spoils from all their future victories. So, if a tithe is the first 10% of increase, what's an offering? An offering is a gift beyond the tithe. Tithing is returning the first 10%, which belongs to God, and an offering is a gift over and above that first 10%. The Bible talks about the gifts beyond the tithe, and it even references extravagant offerings, such as large gifts done by David and by Solomon. But one of the most extravagant offerings in the Bible is the widow's mite story, where Jesus said, All these people, they gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. It reminds me of Mandy's story today from the potter's house. Now, I imagine some of you are sitting there right now saying, 10%? My mind is blown. I'm tuning the rest of this out. Others are probably pre-writing your email to Dee Dee right now saying, never, ever let Justin speak in church again. And I'm hoping at least maybe one or two of you are saying, well, I already give 10% or more and hope to increase it. Well, I submit to you that if you give the first fruits of your labor to God, God will bless you. God says in Malachi, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, I'm not trying to say that God doesn't love you or that you can't go to heaven if you don't tithe or if you don't give it all. We're saved by grace and by faith, not by works, but just try it. Put God to the test. To be clear, don't give, though, just to try to receive something. That's not what God wants. God wants you to have faith. He wants you to be like a river with God's blessings flowing into you and out to others. Have faith that if you do tithe with the proper heart, God will bless the other 90% and stretch it to provide for all your needs. How does he do that? Because he's God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. To my third point, gratitude feeds generosity. Having a grateful heart opens you up to being more generous. If you truly love somebody, it's pretty impossible not to be generous to them in some way. But if anyone does something nice to you or is helpful to you, you naturally want to give back something to them. Well, Think about a much more extreme example. Think about if you, or think about if your child, had a life-threatening disease where they were in pain and suffering. What would you give for their cure? If one of my girls or one of any of my family here were suffering in that way, was in a lot of pain, was having a life-threatening disease, and somebody else had a cure, I would give that person whatever they want. I would give them my house, my 401k, anything, and I would cheerfully do it out of gratitude. Now think about Jesus, God's son. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Through Jesus, God first gave to us. Jesus went and he humbled himself from being in heaven with God to becoming human in a fallen world. He then willingly offered his life. First, Jesus was beaten. He was flogged by the Romans, causing unimaginable pain. Then 
They put a crown of thorns on his head. They pierced his hands and his feet with nails, and they crucified him. Jesus loves us more than we love ourselves. No matter what we have done, no matter how sinful we have been, Jesus has paid the price for our sin. He's broken the curse of our sins. And heaven? Well, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. How can we not be eternally grateful? Jesus is the purest example of love and generosity, and he asks us to go and do likewise. So later, when you're at home, please pray and ask God what he is saying to you through this message. Ask God how generosity aligns your heart with him, how generosity builds your faith, and how gratitude feeds generosity. Brothers and sisters, freely we have received, freely and gratefully let us give. Amen.